what was the kind of what was the beginning of the spark? Right? What was the original kind of birthing of a spiritual appetite or curiosity for to you? To teach or to um, for your path for initially. my own discovery? Yeah, like was that always there? Mm -hmm. or was yes, in a very natural way, like very unrealized way. If that makes sense. So it wasn't um, it wasn't a conscious thought that oh, I'm conscious of something that's that's inspiring me. But very much so, especially looking back, like I'm able to place it all in such a clear context. Um, I can see that ever since I can remember myself being human, uh, I I just had this this sort of indescribable sense of limitlessness or everything is possible. I always felt everything is possible, like everything is possible. So I had this, uh, and I guess a lot of kids have it in, in many ways. I just remember it being very palpable for me, very physical, a, a very, it was an actual belief system, like it was an actual conviction. I was convinced everything is possible. So whenever it seemed like things were not possible, it didn't make any sense to me. It just hmm. didn't make sense, like everything is possible. You know, I always felt like I'm Superman or whatever, I, I'm about to fly and take off. Now this spark allowed me to always throughout childhood up to the age of 12 i'd say 11 12 to be really spontaneous and really just feeling completely free and um connected within myself to something bigger and at around that age i started forgetting um mm -hmm. i started to lose track of that sense that feeling and i became more like people <laughs> <laughs> more like a the average Joe that we see walking around the street, not really, not really aware of any special, magnificent connection within. And were you aware that something was, you were losing touch or something? I was only it was in hindsight. You I, look yeah, back in and, hindsight. Yeah. So I was not aware because it happened gradually uh, around the time that I went to high school, I think, and in Holland. This is. I realized that maybe three years later, at the age of fifteen, I just stopped at some point. I was like. For the past four years or so, I've been, there's been drama in my life. There's been like weird things. There's been this sense of not being myself. I'm just like, I'm trying to live for other people. I'm trying to blend in. I'm trying to fit in. I'm trying to be somebody. And I suddenly remembered very clearly how I used to be. And how I used to be was just like, I didn't care what anyone thought. You know, it's just free. And it, it, the only exception is that I, I was always very careful of making sure I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there was no... There was no real sense of I care what people think about me. I was always free doing crazy things. So I remembered that so clearly from that contrasting experience of having a sense of depression to um, this is not who I am. Like this is so, so in, in a sense, the depression, the layer that I put over my light, the dusty layer that I put on my mirror, so to speak, became dense enough for me to feel to wake up, basically to feel like, OK, wait, something is wrong here. This is not who I am. This is not how I remember myself to be. So I started seeking for, <clears throat> I was exposed before that time to like around the age of 10, I was exposed to books like uh, The Alchemist mm -hmm. by Paolo Coelho. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did Silva Mind Control course mm -hmm. for kids, which is about basic meditation techniques and using the mind in the alpha wave frequencies and the theta wave frequencies. So I had this background as a kid and I was, you know, that was very much, for me that resonated at the time as a confirmation that humans were actually doing something that confirmed everything was possible. It's like, oh, hey, it does make sense here on Earth. It makes sense that everything is possible. Uh, but still, I forgot about that, or I just, it, it became less important for me um, for a period of about four years. So then I had that wake-up call, and I, uh, I started out um, researching telekinesis for some reason. I don't know exactly how that happened. but uh, So I joined a couple websites and blogs and communities of people actually practicing like moving light objects without touching them. This was the Superman thing still going on, this right? Was, what? This was the Superman kind of like quality, right? Yeah, it was the Superman quality, yeah. yeah. So the kid came back like, hey, I can do everything. Okay, right. so let me prove it by doing something everyone believes to be impossible, right? right? So I started practicing that, did that for maybe five, six months, uh, pretty intensely, I was engaged in that community. I got my first real hit of what it's like to teach and, um, and be a teacher in online communities in that regard. Um, I got my confirmations of being able to move certain objects without touching them. And, um, and then I realized like, okay, I've been practicing this for five months. And I was like, you know, I could, every once in a while I could roll a pen. And 
It's like, but this is, I've been practicing intensely for five or six months, and this is all that, you know, I'm not doing anything significant, <laughs> per se. It's just party tricks. You want to, you want to move the world, not a pen, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You want to transform the world. It's not going to happen right. from here. <laughs> so I woke up from that, and I was like, well, okay, so this is a nice confirmation. This, is, this feels good. This feels empowering. feels like it's a representation of who I really am. However, it doesn't take me where I want to go. So I realized that in order to really master any aspect of life, I would have to know the source of all of it. So this was when I was around 15 years old. Um, so I, I remember having this thought. I was practicing telekinesis. And I was like, I'm kind of tired of practicing. Do I really want to practice for the next 10 years until I can like levitate a chair? It doesn't seem that appealing to me. Right. Uh, the, the payoff doesn't seem big enough for the practice. So there's a fa there must be a faster way. There must be a faster way to understanding all aspects and having mastery over all aspects. Now, over time, that shifted from, you know, became less important to have physical mastery and more important to have emotional mastery and yes. mental mastery and well-being mastery and, um, and touching lives and inspiration and all that stuff. But at the time, it was very much like, like, I want to master everything. Like, the everything is possibleness. Like, I want that. So how do I, how do I achieve that? What's the quickest way? And I just had this hit, this insight, I need to know the source of all of it. Mm. If, I, if I can focus my minimal amount of time uh, sorry, the, you know, we all have minimum amount of time available in this life. So I was like, okay, if I just devote all that energy into one thing instead of trying to master all these aspects, and what it, should it, I pour it into? And so source came up, like the source of all of it, because then you have mastery over all of it. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting as well, I was just reflecting as you were talking, it's a very generation Y or whatever generation we kind of are approached like, I want it now. Yeah. Like I, I want to do it quickly, and I want it now. And, yeah. I want, and it, it's it's interesting. It's like when you ask a different question, you come from a different place. Often, new cool. possibilities mm -hmm. get opened as well. So yes, yeah. So so then I shifted to that, and I uh, I think one of the first books I came in contact with that was really deliberately looking for the source of all of life, like enlightenment, reaching the absolute or the ultimate, um, was the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So I was probably 15, 16 years old, and I started studying the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Um, I joined a yoga meditation teacher training that lasted three years. Um, and so I started meditating and contemplating, um, and I was, very, I was very deliberate in this, very fiery, so to speak, like no nonsense, you know, like cutting through all the bullshit. Um, excuse me. No, you can swear here. Like oh, you, so we can swear. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, lo I love this company, Consciousu. <laughs> dot com. <laughs> My kind of people. We, we had someone just as an aside. We had someone on Tuesday night, and he, and he was like, "Can I swear?" I was like, "We've had loads of f bombs. <laughs> We've had a c bomb." I was like, "No, of course you have got a c bomb." So I think basically ed ed anything's allowed now. So just like wherever you want to go. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, anyway, so that, so there you were. You were you were kind of um, you just read uh, the uh, sutras, and you were kind of you were kind of intense in terms of the search. Yeah, very much so. And I um, so I spent time with my yoga teacher at the time, meditation teacher, and she was lovely. She was amazing. She was my first sort of proper teacher, and in some senses, my only because it was consistent for three years, and I never stayed with a teacher for longer than like mm -hmm. a week or so. So. This was my first experience of having that type of teacher-student relationship uh, mm -hmm. within that yoga meditation um, training. And as awesome as she was and her, and her instructions were, it was too much. You know, there were all these housewomen. Uh, how, sorry, how do you call that? Housewives. Uh, housewives. Right. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, and they were just, they were, you know, they were talking about like seeing all these beautiful blue little lights in their meditation and like, oh, this is so lovely and that's so lovely. And I was like, okay, I'm so, I love you guys, but like, I want enlightenment. Where's, <laughs> right. where's this going? You know, like, let's cut to the chase there. Um, so, so a lot of that kind of stuff felt very redundant to me, felt very much like, and even some of the meditations that we were asked to do just felt like it was going around in circles and it wasn't. Yeah going straight to what I wanted, which is source, which is clarity, which is enlightenment, which is the absolute totality. Yeah, you didn't just want to feel better or ch you, wanted, you wanted something radical. You wanted, yes. you wanted to know. I wanted to not waste right. any time and get to, to, get to the very source of everything. So, um, so I left uh, a year early and it just didn't resonate to finish it. And I went to India instead. I was like, okay, where's the source of mm. what I'm right. doing here? And the source of yoga is considered to be Rishikesh, India. So I was mm. like, okay, I'll go there. 
So around the age of, I think it was 17 or 18, I went to live in Rishikesh for six months and uh, go visit all kinds of teachers there, do all kinds of trainings and yoga, meditation, but also other kinds of teachings, more traditional satsang type of experiences. Non-duality, awakening, direct awakening. I, I read a ton of Osho at the time. Mm -hmm. Like I read like 20, 25 books of his, I think. Um, which was one of the most influential at that mm -hmm. period in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started getting glimpses of what I was actually looking for, which in my experience at the time was, um, I don't know how I described it at the time, but right now I would just simply call it awareness or pure awareness. Mm -hmm. So the experience of the, of the non-dual, the non-dual state of consciousness. Mm. Um, the only problem was that I believed there were obstacles to this. I believed that I had to train and meditate and, and quiet my mind. That's what I was told all mm -hmm. the time. But even that didn't resonate. Even that felt like it's not cutting to the chase. Like, like this is a theme in my life. It's like, no, how can we do this faster? How can mm -hmm. we do this now? How can we do this more efficiently? So I was very much like something is off even about this. So I would quiet my mind. I would have the experience and then my mind would come back. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So. At some point, I started to notice that even when I'm busy thinking, even when I'm caught up in distraction, that which I recognized without thinking is also still there mm. when I am thinking. And that really blew up for me. Like, that was like, oh, oh, nice, because now you can't go anywhere. Like, now you're stuck with enlightenment, basically. 